Hello, uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, the judoka John Newman uh, in um, biographical Britain and Japan biographical portraits, volume 10. I wrote about him uh, with help from other people. Um, and in fact, here's the first page. Uh, that's John Newman there. Okay, chapter 12 of the book. And uh, edited by Sir Hugh Cortazzi. Okay, so here we go. John Newman, 1925 to 1993, judoka, broadcaster and academic. Um, introduction. John Edward Brian Newman was born in Kingsbury in the London suburb of Brent. Uh, actually, it says Brenton in the text, which is um, not my mistake. I, I don't know what happened there, but anyway. Um, in fact, uh, King Kingsbury is now in the London borough of Brent since 1965. At the time when he was born in 1935, it was not part of Brent, which did not exist. Okay, but anyway, uh, he was born in Kingsbury on the 13th of December, Kingsbury Middlesex, let's say, uh, as the Independent says in the obituary. Oh. Uh, my cat is joining us. <laughs> uh, on the 13th of December 1935, he attended a primary school, St Andrew's Junior School, run by the Church of England from 1941 to 1945, and Duddon Hill Secondary County School in West London, North Wilsden, from 1946 to 1952, where he became school captain. That was a good effort. She's, she often does that, actually. <laughs> During his national service in the Royal Marines in Malta, Italy, and Turkey from 1953 to 1956, he served in the Elite Special Boat Squadron, SBS. From 1956 to 1958, he was a trainee in the printing house of E.S. and A. Robinson in London. From 1958 to 1962, i.e. in his mid-20s, he was an external lecturer in English and a Japanese language student at Tenri University, the center of Judo in Nara Prefecture, Japan. During this time, he obtained a diploma in Japanese studies from Tenri University in 1961, and in 1964, a London University GCE A-level in Japanese after a two-year period studying Japanese at SOAS, uh, 1962 to 1964. On his curriculum vitae, uh, submitted later to Nihon University Medical School, he wrote, in 1964, I received an attractive offer, offer from the BBC to join their newly expanding Japanese service. This offered a good prospect of ultimately succeeding Mr. Trevor Leggett, that's L-E-G-G-E-T-T, -T, as head of the service. I interrupted my studies and accepted it. From 1967 to 1969, Newman was seconded by the BBC to NHK's Radio Japan in Tokyo as an English announcer and news editor. His duties, as stipulated by NHK, included translation, rewriting and announcement of English news and language programmes and training of NHK staff. He contributed to programmes such as Hello from Tokyo, into which he introduced for foreign listeners information about the way of life of Japanese people. On trips with his Japanese producer, he covered such Japanese traditional events as cormorant fishing on the river Nagara in Gifu Prefecture, central Japan. On other broadcasts, he described the famous whirlpools created by rapid tidal currents in the Naruto Strait by Shikoku Island, actually it's between Shikoku and Awaji Island, as well as other scenic spots and places of int historic interest in Japan. He established a good rapport with his Japanese colleagues who appreciated his gentle and polite demeanor. In 1969, he was the BBC representative for British Week in Tokyo, and in 1970, BBC representative to Expo 70 in Osaka. In 1970, he was appointed in his mid-30s to head the Japanese service, and in 1988 was awarded the MBE for services to broadcasting. He continued as head of the Japanese service until the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, FCO, decided to close down the service in 1991. At that point, he declined promotion within the BBC and chose early retirement, whereupon he was offered a position as Professor of English and International Studies 
at the Nihon University's medical school. There were three main strands to Newman's life in and involve, involvement with Japan. Like his predecessor as the BBC's correspondent the, and man in Japan, Trevor Price Leggett, 1914 to 2000, who was portrayed in Britain and Japan Biographical Portraits, Volume 4, Chapter 28, pages 323 to 333, and with whom he co-authored some books, he was a highly competent judoka and also a first-class teacher of judo and English. Judoka, judo practitioner, and at Tenri University. In a self-introduction written for Nihon University Medical School's Igakubu News, John Newman wrote that his relationship with Japan began with judo. It was an obscure sport introduced to Britain by Tani Yukio in 1904. Reference to the martial art appears in George Bernard Shaw's play, Major Barbara, 1905. Sherlock Holmes uses Japanese wrestling to escape from Moriarty at the Reichenbach Falls in Conan Doyle's Return of Sherlock Holmes. It was these stories probably introduced by the highly literate Leggett, who, which encouraged Newman to learn judo. Newman began judo at the Central YMCA in London under John Barnes of the Budokwai. He was identified as talented and referred to the Budokwai in the 1950s. At the Budokwai, uh, Trevor Leggett was the most influential teacher. He encouraged his pupils to go to Japan to learn judo, where he had been interned during the war. Leggett was a concert pianist, a Japanese chess player, author, and a great linguist. He demanded high standards, and according to his reputation, he did not suffer fools gladly. Newman was a stylist with a good technique in judo. He had an upright posture and mastered the major throws such as uchimata, a big overt movement, which Westerners usually find hard. He was also good at ashiwaza, foot sweeping. During his national service in the Royal Marines, he was kept fit, but there were no opportunities to practice the sport. He made a great impression at Tenry University with his effective and stylish technique, his personable, polite, and gentlemanly manners. Already with two European championships under his belt, he proved his efficiency by winning the groundwork Newaza competition, a remarkable achievement. Tenry is a hard and serious judo school, whose trainer at the time was the Japanese Olympic team manager. Training included early morning runs with his small dog in pursuit, yapping at the heels of stragglers. On his first day at Tenri in April 1959, Newman met Kobayashi Takanobu, who, like Newman, was a fresh, was freshman at Tenri. Was a freshman, I think, should, should be. Um, when Kobayashi, a country-born boy from Hiroshima, tried his limited English with Newman, he received a friendly reply and the two became firm friends. After Trevor Leggett, the former president of the World Judo Association, introduced him to Nakayama Shozen, the founder of Tenri University and the second head, Shimbashira, of the Tenri religion, Nakayama arranged for Newman to perfect his skills at Tenri. Newman practiced from 5 to 7 p.m. on weekdays with the judo major students. He, tr he struggled to communicate. One day he wanted bananas and hamburger buns, he drew pictures and asked his caretaker to go shopping for them. She brought back takuan, yellow pickled radish, and anpan, bean paste buns. He missed London and read J.B. Priestley's novels and Noel Coward's plays. He recalled that during the Blitz, when his family sheltered in the tube, he had stumbled and broken his chin, but he had not cried. The scar remained. While at Tenri, he enrolled on the Japanese language course for foreign students. One summer, he hitchhiked with a Hawaiian friend for 10 days along the 53 stations of the Tokaido. He came back sunburned and exhausted, but, but was able to tell many funny stories of his adventures, like Yajirobe and Kitahachi of Jipensha Ikku's Hizakurige. He was blessed with the necessary intelligence, strength, perseverance, and fortitude to be a great athlete. He was proficient in sports and physical exercise, and he mastered new sports very quickly. On a skiing training camp, he was able to ski down a hill on his first day in the heat of summer. Uh, sorry, much to the surprise of all. He was always well dressed in a tie, even in the heat of summer, 
and he was never carried away by radical emotions. Kobayashi thought he held his passions in check like a disciplined Japanese samurai. Yet he was also agreeable and sociable, joining picnics, speech contests, and other outings with Japanese students. He and Kobayashi wandered around the hills and historic sites of the Kansai region, Osaka, Kyoto, and Nara. They played table tennis and listened to scratchy phonograph records of musicals, which Newman had brought from London. His farewell present to Kobayashi in March 1962 was a phonograph record of Oklahoma, the musical. Newman was awarded a scholarship by Tenry University and he taught four classes to English majors. He was paid 20,000 yen a month for this. He lived simply toasting loaves of plain bread when hungry. He cheerfully called charred toast golden brown. When he had money, he went with Kobayashi to a cinema in Nara and they ate heartily at a cheap restaurant. In 1961, Newman had an operation for sciatic neuralgia at a hospital in Kyoto. Although confined in a stuffy and crowded hospital for several months, he recovered. The doctor, however, told him that he had to give up his judo career. This must have been a great shock to him. Kobayashi remarked, I did not know how to console him. He courageously challenged his trial and did as much rehabilitation exercise as he could. I thought he was a real samurai with discipline, stoicism and perseverance. For rehabilitation, we walked together even in the snow covered mountains and hills in Nara. He was always hopeful and optimistic. Another Japanese who remembered Newman at Tenry University was Imamura Haruo, who had been studying in Fresno, California, and returned to Japan in April 1961 for four months to renew his visa and taught as a part-time judo instructor at Tenry. As they both spoke English, he and Newman often went drinking together, and he remembered that John associated for a while with the American talent TV personality Edith Hansen, born 1939. Yoshida Shintaro, who remembered Newman's strong British accent in Japanese, was surprised when John refused to remove his jacket in a poorly air-conditioned train heading from Tenri to Osaka in the height of summer when everyone else was in shirt sleeves. John never took it off and just said, oh, I am fine. John told him he was a green beret, a headdress worn by all Royal Marines who have passed the commando course. Uh, certainly a prestigious uh, status within the Royal Marines. Uh, a tall man at six feet, 4.5 inches, and with very large feet, UK size 13, which probably helped him root him, helped root him to the ground. He won the British Judo Championship four times and the European Championship twice, all before going to Tenry. He became a fifth dan and was manager come coach of the British Judo team at the Tokyo Olympics in 1964. Before the Olympics, he had retired from active Judo due to back pain. As the team manager in 1964, he met the British team, which traveled part of the way to Japan on the Trans-Siberian Railway. He organized railway tickets for them to go to Tenry University for their training camp. His time at Tenry was a loss for the British team. Um, and if he had not been injured, he could have been a team member at the Tokyo Olympics. John Newman followed his own path in Judo and Japanese culture. He was an excellent example of what Leggett set out to achieve. Judo was not to be practiced merely for a sporting outcome, but for self-improvement. Training hard in Judo, he believed, led to excellence in other areas of life as well. It was a means of gaining the wisdom to achieve excellence in other fields. For Newman, who had no career pathway, Judo not only introduced him to Japan, but helped him to rise to become head of the Japanese service of the BBC. Of course, the fact that his judo teacher was also employed at the BBC helped him. Newman taught judo at the Budokwai in the Chelsea area of London and at Halsden. The Budokwai had been founded in 1918 by Koizumi Gunji, a Japanese immigrant. He sought to repay the kindness he had received in Britain by introducing the martial arts of kendo and judo. It is the oldest martial arts club in Europe. Broadcaster with the BBC and NHK, 1964 to 91. Newman had assisted the BBC Japanese service on a part-time basis before he joined as a full-time staff member, producer, in November, 1964. In his first year, he was responsible for the morning transmission, evening in the UK due to the eight or nine hours time difference. 
This was his first experience of live broadcasting. It was nerve wracking and he began to smoke more heavily. From 1967 to 1969, he was seconded to Radio Japan, the external service, service of NHK and worked in Tokyo. John Newman succeeded Trevor Leggett in October 1969 as program organizer and worked at Bush House in London. Leggett had stayed in this position for 23 years, refusing any promotion. When Newman started the job, he discussed with the Japanese staff how to make the content of programs more varied. The success of this policy was reflected in the increase in the number of letters from listeners. From an annual number of about 3,500 in 1969, it increased year on year until in 1975, it reached a peak of 140,000 letters. Although Japanese businessmen overseas frequently listened to the BBC Japanese service, the majority of listeners were in Japan. Teenage boys who had a fascination for listening to shortwave radio from abroad formed the core of the most enthusiastic listeners. When they listened to the BBC and sent letters to London, they were able to receive verification cards, which they enjoyed collecting. When in 1970, Newman attended Expo 70 in Osaka, his fluent Japanese was a great help in promoting the British Pavilion. He also frequently appeared on Japanese television where, since few Japanese grew beards, his trademark black beard was a distinguishing asset. On one occasion, he appeared in a Nescafe instant coffee advert in a Japanese newspaper without the beard. The Japanese service under Newman included as producer, later senior producer, Anthony Lightley, that's L-I-G-H-T-L-E-Y, who joined in 1971 after a career which included involvement with the Doctor Who series and who had studied Japanese at Durham University. There were also nine program assistants, Japanese broadcasters. Most of them were seconded for periods of up to three years from Japanese radio and television stations. In all, some hundred Japanese were seconded to the BBC Japanese service. In addition, there were a number of audience researchers who worked in a different building and dealt with letters from listeners. Some of the Japanese producers, after returning to Japan, wrote articles and books about various life, various aspects of life in Britain. Simul Press in Tokyo, with whom John had established close, close contacts, published these in a BBC series. Lightly was a well-organized and precise man, whereas Newman was easygoing and did not pay much attention to details, although he was generous and broad-minded. They formed an excellent combination, creating a pleasant working environment for their staff. One BBC Japanese program had a segment called Letterbox once every two weeks in which Newman and Lightly spoke Japanese. They discussed letters from the audience and answered questions from them. Newman's deep soft voice was very popular and he was vo voted foreign broadcaster of the year several times. Lightly spoke Japanese with a typical English accent, but Newman's Japanese sounded natural. Lightly was shy and never spoke Japanese with the Japanese staff, but Newman sometimes spoke Japanese with them. They were impressed by the colloquial expressions he used, presumably picked up while at Tenry University. Newman also gave short English conversation lessons in a segment called Ego de Dozo, in English, please. Secondees from NHK Radio Japan wrote the script and Newman modeled the English phrases. After Newman established a close relationship with the British Tourist Authority, BTA, a series of mini travel guides to the British countryside were broadcast. The BTA arranged tours to various parts of Britain and every summer Newman sent his program assistants to the countryside. These short guides proved quite popular. The Japanese service program sometimes broadcast radio dramas such as Sherlock Holmes and Robin Hood. While major roles were played by Japanese program assistants, Newman sometimes joined in minor roles and acted in Japanese. He appeared to enjoy these chances for amateur dra dramatics. One of the most successful transmissions in which J John Newman was involved was the coverage of the Sapporo Snow Festival in 1977. Sapporo Snow Festival one of Japan's largest winter events, every year attracts about 2 million people from Japan and abroad. Its main attraction is a large number of huge splendid snow and ice sculptures lining the main street of the city for a week in the beginning of February. When the Sapporo branch of the Japan BCL Broadcasting Listeners League started, 
1976, they planned to build a snow sculpture of the Palace of Westminster with 4.5 meter high clock tower and sought from BBC Japanese service details of the design of the building. John Newman saw this as a great opportunity for publicity for the BBC Japanese service and featured a simultaneous transmission from London and Sapporo in February 1977. John traveled to Sapporo and broadcast live in Japanese on the spot in front of the Snow Big Ben. After the event, he and his Japanese producer went to Josanke Spa in the suburbs of Sapporo to recuperate and absorb some warmth. Josanke, yes, famous spa or onsen. While working with Radio Japan, John, like many other foreigners who lived in Japan, climbed Mount Fuji. He did so together with his Japanese producer, Hosokawa Yukimasa, who had a hard time keeping up because of John's long legs. They stayed at the lodge on the eighth station and started before dawn the next morning for the summit, toiling up the zigzag path and through volcanic ash together with a crowd of other climbers. Unfortunately, as so many others have found, the panorama was hidden by fog. John quoted to his Japanese producer the saying, Mount Fuji is best seen from a distance. On the 1st of April 1980, the Japanese service announced that the clock on the Tower of Big Ben, officially known since 2012 as Elizabeth Tower, was going digital and that therefore the hands would be removed. The first person to write to the Japanese service would get one of the 6.5 meter long big hands, which were no longer required. They embellished this tall story by saying that a flood warning alarm would be installed as well as a stopwatch to time the London Marathon. It was normal practice to make clear that the April Fool's Day transmissions were jokes, but on this occasion, Newman told his staff not to mention this, saying he would take responsibility for the consequences. Within an hour of the transmission, the Japanese service received a telegram from a seaman on board a tanker asking for the hand. Soon they had received about 300 letters from all over Japan applying for the Big Ben hand. John Newman revealed the joke about three days later. Major Japanese newspapers reported this as an example of the failure of Japanese to understand British humor, but no serious complaints were received by the Japanese service. The listeners seemed to have understood the humor and joined in the fun. When the Foreign and Commonwealth Office under budgetary pressure decided in 1991 to close down BBC services to Malaysia and Japan. The BBC was not given the option to continue the services by making savings elsewhere. The savings, a mere 300, pounds to 400, 300 to 400,000 pounds, were minuscule, especially compared to the investment by Japanese firms in Britain. And many Japanese received it as a snub, but John Newman accepted what was a bitter blow with dignity. He managed the dispersal of his talented Japanese staff without losing their respect. In the Japan Digest of January 1991, in an article headed Sayonara Japan, Newman gave an overview of the 47 years of broadcasting to Japan. The service began on the 4th of July 1943, when the mere possession of a shortwave radio was dangerous. Many listeners were in the Japanese armed forces in Southeast Asia, and later the 50,000 strong Japanese community in Brazil also joined in. Trevor Leggett organized a game of shogi over the air to prove that the service could be heard in Japan and it lasted a year. Moves from London were broadcast once a week and the Japanese player would send his moves in reply two days later by airmail. Leggett persuaded a noted blind koto player, Miyagi Michio, to compose Rondon no Yoru no Ame, a rainy London evening for the Japan service. Newman also recorded the, so recalled the April Fool episode and more than a hundred Japanese seconded to the BBC from Japan who had used their experience at Bush House to further their careers. Academic. In 1991, Anisaki Masahira was a professor of sociology at Nihon University School of Medicine, which was looking for a professor of English and international studies. He saw a news item on television about the abolition of the Japan service of the BBC in which John Newman appeared. This inspired him to write to John Newman suggesting that he apply for the post. Newman being at the time at a loose end replied expressing great interest. At the interview, Anisaki recalls that he made a very good impression on us, not only with his height, handsome looks and articulate speech, but also his gentlemanly demeanor. 
He got the job quite easily with few reservations expressed. Anisaki told him he would be accepted as easily as William Adams was by Tokugawa Ieyasu. He continues, he brought big ideas about teaching English to future physicians, as well as various audiovisual materials with him from Britain. His serious attitude to his teaching and his good sense of humor motivated his students to try hard. Newman was popular, not only with the students, but also with the teaching and administrative staff. Anisaki became a close colleague and friend, and they often watched sumo together and spoke about martial arts. They also discussed the state of Britain in the 1960s and 1970s. Anisaki tried to learn BBC English pronunciation and courtliness from Newman. Conclusion. John Newman did not drink alcohol because he had cirrhosis of the liver. Despite having to go into hospital repeatedly, he completed the academic year 1992 to three, including all his freshman class and classes and exams. At the start of the spring vacation, he returned to London and decided to have a liver transplant on the 10th of April, 1993 at King's College Hospital. Unfortunately, one week later, his body began to reject the new liver. On the 18th of May, 1993, he passed away in the intensive care unit at the hospital, aged 57. The funeral at the West London Crematorium on the 27th of May was well attended with all 200 seats filled and the rest of the mourners standing. Pauline Webb conducted the ceremony. A Japanese version of the 23rd Psalm was read and Trevor Leggett gave a tribute. There was a reading by his friend, Jill Wilkie of the BBC Malaysian service from Coleridge's Ancient Mariner and in conclusion, a version of Stand By Me, somehow fitting for its emphasis on how love can conquer all adversity and hardship. It was a modern pop song, which John Newman liked. Professor Anisaki attended that funeral and wake and later reported on it to the university. In the evening, he and Watanabe Kisaburo, a former Asian judo champion and instructor at the Budokan Judo Club in London, dined with Newman's daughters, Martha and Sophie. Donations were to the liver failure unit, King's College Hospital and Cancer Research. John Newman was a deeply patriotic Briton from a working class West London family background who was proud of his country and London and eager to show them off to Japanese visitors. He was a man with a great sense of adventure and fun, personal warmth, self-discipline and physical toughness. He is fondly remembered, not only by his family, but also by his many friends in Japan and Britain. His love affair with Japan began through judo at a time in the post-war period when memories of the war were still very fresh and when many people in Britain viewed Japan with suspicion and hostility. In the Newman family, his daughter Sophie recalls that can't was a taboo word and he was always keen to let his children experience adventures. He once had them camping overnight near St. Paul's Cathedral before the wedding of Prince Charles and Lady Diana to get a good view of the procession. On another occasion, he had Sophie travel alone in her early teens from Tokyo to Kyoto, although she knew no Japanese. It was on this occasion that Kobayashi met her while her father was still working for the BBC. Later, whenever Kobayashi went to London, he would meet Newman at the BBC or at his flat in Russell Road, West Kensington. In the summer of 1992, he stayed one month there and Newman took him to the golf course, swimming pool and Richmond where his family lived. John Newman's secretary at the BBC in London for 14 and a half years was Afsane Dekan. She considered him as family and a gentle giant and felt very lucky to be working for him. He did not work on Mondays, but would occasionally pay surprise visits on that day, opening the office door quickly and saying with characteristic English humor learned in the Marines and one imagines a wry grin, what do you think this place is, a holiday camp? He sometimes called his daughters and announced that the monsters were coming to the office for lunch. Observing Japan, Japanese custom, Newman would always start a letter to Japan with a comment on the season or weather. His nickname in the office was Big Bad John. The monsters were coming to the office for lunch. I wonder who they were. In the county of Dorset, there is an oak tree planted by the parish in the cemetery of St. Mary's Church in the village of Blandford St. Mary in, com in commemoration of the man they called the Oak. This very English tree testifies to the high regard in which he was held for his friendliness and community spirit. 
The Newman family used to go there for holidays for many years, and sometimes John stayed in the cottage, which belonged to a BBC colleague, colleague for weekend breaks. The author, that's me, is very grateful to the following for their cooperation, encouragement and materials in alphabetical order. Professor Anisaki Masahira, Hosokawa Yukimasa, Sue Hudson, Kobayashi Takanobu, Sophie Newman, Tony Sweeney, and Tsujikawa Kaznori. And that is the end. I have not uh, included the end notes of which there are how many? There are 16 end notes. Um, but anyway, that's the main text of this chapter from Britain and Japan Biographical Portraits, volume 10. And I hope you enjoyed it. See you again soon. <laughs>